In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, after our bonus blessings and permission, um, to the <coughs> tonight obviously is the eve of the Wednesday, uh, the Holy Pascha, and um, I just want to say that the richness of Christianity is enormous. There are so many secrets and so many uh, beautiful gifts of the faith that we're in. It's immensely rich, uh, let alone also um, God allowing us to be part of the, our beautiful Coptic Orthodox Church that has organized for us over the centuries what we've got today. It's, it's, it's so beautiful and should never take it for granted and keep it and deliver it from generation to generation. And we'll go into that a little bit uh, as we go deeper into the discussion tonight. So we, with God's grace, we'll have a look at the day and then the, what happened at the night. We'll bring them together. Um, so tonight, obviously, if you've been listening to the Gospels, this evening is the Lord inviting us to, to the wedding. He speaks about the wedding, um, but there's no mention of the bride, right? He's the groom, and there's a wedding. He's the groom. So the bride is essentially each one of us, um, and he is our personal groom for each one of us. Um, now, this is also important to, to understand when he speaks of marriage, um, from the beginning, God created man and woman, Adam and Eve, and he's the one that gave those titles, husband and wife. Obviously, human beings, um, silly that we are after disconnecting from the grace of God, we dis become dysfunctional and ruin God's work, and men go marrying multitudes of women and divorce as they like, and it gets really, really messy. But from the beginning, that's not the order of God. So in Christianity, obviously Christ comes and restores, and we see very clearly the idea of one man to one woman. Uh, we also understand that the two shall become one flesh. And we hear also in the Old Testament and repeated in the New Testament, but clearly in the Old Testament, that God hates divorce. So the idea of the marriage that is on this world, obviously there are special circumstances, and the church, in, in its wisdom guided by the gospel, uh, makes various decisions on, the, on these matters. But in the core of it, this is the principle of the marriage that the Lord God uh, organized for humanity. And the reason being, obviously, because marriage uh, on earth is a reflection of the marriage between uh, God, uh, or the second person of the Trinity, uh, the Son, and the bride being the church. That the two shall become flesh, one flesh, and that there is no divorce. Right? He doesn't want to. He does not want to divorce us. He wants to keep us uh, eternally. So this is very, very important to to keep in mind. And it also has links to how he will perform salvation as well as we move on um, through the discussion tonight. So also in today's gospel, so this is the invitation, right? So there's an invitation for a marriage, and this is what God is interested. In performing in our life, that we become uh, his bride, our soul becomes his bride, and we're united to him and become one flesh. So, um, looking at um, the morning's gospel, there's an interesting verse where the disciples are with him, they're sitting with him, is in the gospel of Matthew 24, verse 3 says, He sat on the Mount of Olive. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be? What will, be the, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the disciples are saying to him, of, uh, when what will be the sign of your coming? He's with them. So what do you mean the sign of your coming? Obviously, they've worked out and understood now his glory, right? He's the king of kings. They, they got what it means. The idea of he is the judge, he will return, and they are starting to understand now, right? And they're asking about his return, and they're asking about the end of the ages. Now, because we read these readings tonight, and it correlates with it, the opposite, on the other side of it, the rejection that comes from the Jews and the Pharisees at that time, um, and what happens is they begin to plot against the Lord Jesus Christ in the night like this. So there's like a um, contrast that is happening here. Here are his disciples, and they're saying to him, you're the king. When are you coming? And on the contrast on the other side, they're plotting, the Pharisees are plotting for his um, persecution and murder and crucifixion, all these things. Therefore, the church says, oh, wait, we are going to align ourselves with the disciples, obviously. Right? 
So beginning from the morning, the 11th hour, the church proclaims, right? So we sing the, the beautiful psalm, Pekathronos, right? Your throne, O God, forever. All right, so we proclaim him king. If they're going to plot against you, we say you are king. Um, and we add, in, actually, in the, in the Thok Teti Gom, my good savior, right? So you are my savior. Right? So we proclaim this clearly as a church, and we're going to add another verse to it as we move along. But for now, we're not only are we saying Thok Teti Gom, but saying you are my good savior, and Pekka Thronos, your throne is forever, right? So we have this commitment to Christ, right? We're going to become one with him, remember? Because we're, there's a wedding, and we're the bride. Our soul is the bride of the, soul of the Lord. Therefore, we are united with him, becoming one flesh. This is our affiliation. This is what we want to do. And we do it very, we proclaim it very loudly. Just a note quickly um, on this. I'm not going to take too long on this one. The... Um, the coming of the Christ, um, as Orthodox, we don't believe in this thing called the rapture, right? We don't have this stuff about the, the rapture where the good will be taken away and the others are going to, they're going to cop it. And, and that we don't have that understanding. In fact, the Lord Jesus says, um, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So... <sighs> The reality is we also will suffer these tribulations, okay? But we have our Lord to strengthen us during that time. We have his promise as well that he will, he, he will be with us and he will shorten the days even. Um, but it is true that when he returns, those who are with him, and as it mentions in the Thessalonians, will be taken up. And he says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then he who are, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, with them, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the, in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Yes, that will happen, but that is on the last day. But once he returns, that's the end, obviously. We don't have that idea of um, he comes in a little bit and then comes again. No, we don't have that understanding. In fact, that's very, very dangerous um, because if we are going to think that he's going to come and hang around a little bit, careful because we also understand there's an antichrist. So just be careful. We might get deceived. The antichrist proclaims himself as the one that does the Christ and gets really confused that he's on earth. It's really messy. So we don't have that, right? Christ comes once, finished. There's no concept of him coming a little bit and not, we don't have that kind of stuff, right? So just keep that in mind. Going back to what we are focused on, the, the wedding and affiliation of our lives with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is really, really important. So to do that, um, I want to, and um, I really, uh, for those who, I know a couple of people with us in Archangel a couple of nights ago, forgive me, but I'll, I'll, I'll need to repeat this because I think it's important. Um, we, are, have, we have this invitation, all right? And this invitation... Um, the church sort of um, puts it um, in, in searches in various places in, in the journey, right? So, uh, and elaborates how the invitation is being performed. So, I don't know if you guys remember, if you came early on Sunday morning, there was a procession of the cross, and we do that a couple of times, during, but for now, uh, Palm Sunday, come early morning, there's a procession of the cross, right? I'm going to summarize the first parts quickly, then we'll try to focus on the end parts, because I think it's important. For those who don't know, um, there are 12 readings, 12 Gospels that we read, and the deacons with the Buna and the icons and the Shuria, we move from the, the, the royal door, which is the one right here in the east, and we start uh, reading 12 Gospels around the church, right? There's a really powerful message inside of that, and inside of it is the, is the invitation that, that helps us to understand the invitation a little bit better, Right? So why the royal door? Because that's where the east, right? This is where the, the kingdom of heaven, the idea of the gates are open, right? The, there's like a, a powerful good news. The gates of heaven are open, right? So the first proclamation is that, right? That the gates of heaven are open. Now, we, we, how, how will salvation be given to us? Well, the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, she's the one 
the bearer and the mother of God is the one, the, the chosen one, right? She's the one that is going to be, uh, through her comes this salvation, this, this gift of life that's going to be given to us. And we insist, insist in calling her the Theotokos, all right? This is extremely important, all right? Anyone tells you otherwise or belittles it or mocks it or anything like that has no idea what they're talking about. But as Coptic Orthodox and as uh, Orthodox or Christians, it's extremely important to hold on to that understanding. Um, we'll come to it at the end. Um, and then we move to the Archangel Gabriel, the Annunciation. She accepts, right? And he is incarnate in her womb. I'm going to come to that as well a bit later. And then we move across to the Archangel Michael, saying the kingdom of heaven is ready to separate the good from the evil, right? Um, and it's better that you stick to the good, right? There is a warning here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The doors are open. The Theotokos is chosen. She's accepted the calling. In her is incarnate the word of God. And also now the angels are ready to separate good from the evil, right? It's ready to go. All right, we're with the good. Excellent. So we move across. Where do we go next? We go to St. Mark. St. Mark brought us the good news. Excellent. That's really good. Thank God for that. That's amazing. The good news is here. But we move across to the apostles after St. Mark. The apostles are telling us, the good news is here, but wait. You let the word of God work in you at home in Jerusalem first. Before you go out to the world and you proclaim anything to do with faith, you live it personally. Right? They lived it personally in their own life. And accept that conviction inside of you first. Then go out to the rest of the world. Right? Yes, sir. Move across quickly to the martyrs. There will be persecution. There will be suffering. Then we'll move across to the saints. All right? The idea of being living the saintly life. We understand. This is all good. But then we move to something very strange. What comes next? Has anyone got confused by the next one? What's the next one? Huh? None after the saints, after the martyrs says, this northern door? What is that? Like, what's with the northern door? It's a bit weird. Why are you going to the northern door? Look, there are links. There are very strong links to Jerusalem, all right? And in Jerusalem, the whole of the old city and where everything was, there are gates around Jerusalem. The royal door is where the king comes from. Right, and he said that's where Jesus came to Jerusalem from the royal door, right, marching in with, and everyone welcomed him with open arms. Northern door, what's at the northern door? Well, there are two things in the northern door. There's the, two main ones. There's a Damascus gate and Herod's gate over there in the northern door. At Damascus gate, we see uh, St. Stephen martyred. St. So Stephen was martyred in that, in that, near that gate. And there's also Herod's door as well over there. Herod's supposed to be the king of Israel, right? He's the one that comes from David. But this guy's a hypocrite. This guy is no, nowhere near who David is. Herod is bad, horrible, has no links to being the king of Israel, the true Israel. It's crazy wrong. So the message is that when you are, have all this offered to you, in the, the northern door is a reminder that you personally might suffer, you might suffer per persecution. You might encounter threats and difficulties. And you also might be killed for his name's sake. Are you ready for that? Personally. Leave the martyrs and leave the saints. You personally, this might happen to you. Are you ready for that? You personally might be encountering hypocrites inside the church. Are you accepting of that? Or are you going to be affected by that? Or are you going to lose the plot because of that? Or are you just going to hold your faith and stay strong? Stay at peace with your own self. So there's a calling here, be at peace. These things can happen, but you be at peace. You be with God. There's a calling for that. Then we move across to the baptismal font, right? And the baptismal font is that the renewal of your mind. The rebirth, right? So there's an, a gift that, that is given to us. 
all these things are not going to happen by your muscles. You are not going to be strong on your own. It just can't happen. We know we are weak. We need to be able to receive all that. We need to be baptized. We need to be born again. We need to have the Him living in us. You can't do it on your own. You just can't. You need Him. So to receive all of that, you need to be able to receive the baptism, right? So that comes really, really powerfully as a really good news. Where do we go after that? Does anyone remember? Another door. We go to the southern door. Why are we going to the southern door? What's the door's got to do with all this? Again, there's links to Jerusalem. What's in the southern door? Southern door is um, it's called the dunk gate, refuse gate. Jerusalem is a city. They used to take all their rubbish, waste, often all the wrong things, yuck things, and they throw them through the southern door. Why the southern door? Well, over there, the Canaanites many years ago, they used to offer their children as sacrifices there. They used to kill them there to their god, Molech, and stuff like that. So the Israelites said, you know, this is evil. Um, this is Johannam, right? It's actually called the Valley of Johannam, right, over there. If you go to Jerusalem now, that's what it's called over there. So this is really bad. How could humans do this, right? It's really bad. It's like today, as I was saying to before to another group, it's like the idea of abortion. To people to, for self-pleasure, kill the child. Just my, my pleasures first. That kind of stuff. It's really, really bad. For the southern gate, why we're reading it after this? We're saying, look, look. If Christ is going to enter your heart, all the waste needs to get out. You need to repent. Throw everything that is wasteful out. Consider your life. Consider what you, what you stand for. What, what wrong is in you, anything that is not good, anything that is not of God, you have to repent from. So this is the calling of repentance, right? It's a calling of change your ways. Like all this stuff that we heard earlier, we heard about the idea of self-persecution and encountering wrong people, but God is with us. He will strengthen us. But as he enters our heart, you need to remove the stuff that is not right out. And there will always be wrong stuff in us. Right? Unfortunately, it will always be there until we leave this earth. But we do believe that certain people, and it could be you personally, experience this, this really because of your faithfulness and commitment to God, really experience something like Ambeb Shoy. We call Sam Bishoy the perfect man. He reached a really incredible good relationship with God that he's cast out all evil from his heart. He's a holy man. That's possible, right? But the, the perfect completion of it is God's work upon our departure from this world. You do the struggle. You keep casting out the rubbish. He keeps cleansing. But the day we leave this flesh is when he perfects it completely. It's completely good. Completely good. Because you are faithful over little, he'll make you faithful over much. All we need to do is just be faithful to remove all the junk out. And that's why we continually repent. Continually confess our sins and get rid of all these things. What's the end product? What's the end product? This is really, really important. The last icon that we go before, and I just want to read this um, uh, right, uh, verse. The last place we go in this procession, 12 Gospels, is in front of the icon of John the Baptist. And look what um, is written there in, John's, in front of the icon of St. John the Baptist. He says the following. <clears throat> it's in Luke 7, 28. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's a little bit confusing, but just let me read it one more time. For I don't know if you guys come across this. So sorry, I don't know. If you, if you know, good. If you don't, this, hopefully this can help. For I say to you, amongst those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Those born of women, prophets, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. The guy is up there. Right? You can't compare. But he adds something to it. He says, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's a powerful verse. I don't know if you've come across it properly. The least, he says, the least, 
but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Meaning, what God is willing to perform in your life is so powerful, so incredibly powerful, that you think John the Baptist, the greater, greatest man born of women, prophet, what God is able to produce, make in your life is the least person is greater than John the prophet. In this, it's crazy. It's a crazy proclamation. And it goes back to this idea of you become partakers of divine nature. This is unbelievable. But we need to remain humble. It doesn't mean you become God himself, but it become, you become something that you would It's a crazy gift that God is willing to give mankind. This is a very holy gift that we take from him. So the end game of you walking with him, the idea of the marriage, him being the groom and you being the bride and soul, the end game is that you know, the procession of the cross eventually is what he said here. At the end game, this is what happens. That you become, because you were one flesh with him, but I, I, I am still who I am. I don't become Christ himself. Just like in marriage. Husband and wife, they're one flesh, but the wife is not the husband, right? And the husband not the wife. They maintain their identity, but they're one flesh, mysteriously, right? Same thing. God, the groom, and us, the bride, we become one flesh with him. And by being one flesh, we have this gift of salvation. It's beautiful that we get this gift from God that we have received the salvation. That's what he wants to perform for us in, in this gift of church and all the things that we've gotten for, before us. And we thank him for it. Um, now, the next part that we're just going to close with is the following. Um, You know how a city was on solid ground? And this is really, really important, I think, in my opinion, anyway. But I'm sure in Abuna's and everyone else's opinion. Um, how God, just the intricate detail, how God has performed the salvation for us. We as Orthodox Christian, we follow um, the first three councils. Uh, we have some consideration for the other Eastern Orthodox Church, some of the other councils. Um, we have ch some challenges and some acceptance. It's here and there, right? And that's for the, the hierarchy of the church to work with the Eastern Orthodox Church and to come to an agreement eventually. However, we have an agreement with the third council, which is our great father, St. Cyril. What does he say? We believe in the one nature of the incarnate word of God. One nature of the incarnate word of God. Which means what we say, a composite of the divine and the human. Not denying the humanity, not denying the divinity. We believe in the one nature of the incarnate word of God. It's composite. Mere physis, as we proclaim of ourselves. This is what our father Cyril proclaimed. And all of the churches accept St. Cyril as a saint. And this is something we don't ever shy away from. It is correct. It's solid ground. Why do we say that? We say it because of the following. And St. Severus also mentioned this. He said, you know when Jesus was walking on water? When he was walking on water? Who was walking on water? Was it the divine or was it the human? He said, we don't do that. We don't differentiate. We don't separate. Because human can't walk on water. But the divine doesn't have legs. The divine can't have legs. So we don't sit there differentiating, right? When you do something, we don't say, oh, your soul did this, or your body did this. No, you did this, right? But whatever you did, you are soul and body. You're not separate. You're not confused, or you're not, you don't sit there separating, oh, my soul did this, or oh, my body did this. That's schizophrenia, right? No one, no one sits there and does that, right? So Christ is one, the one, uh, the one nature of the incarnate word of God. He's one, Right? But at the same time, we're not denying his humanity. And we're not saying that the, the humanity changed in any way. And we don't say his divinity changed in any way, obviously. And they didn't intermingle or, or separate. But this is who Christ is. The one nature of the incarnate word of God. Um, and we also say that for a good reason. Because the one born of the virgin is the incarnate word of God. So we call him, or we call her the Theotokos. The one from whom God is born, right? 
And we understand what that means when we proclaim it. And why is it important? I'll close with that. Because as we celebrate this week, Passion Week, and the end of Good Friday, he was crucified. We can't say the flesh was crucified. If we say that, well, what benefit have we gotten out of that? Could have crucified David the king. What's that going to do? No. The one that was on the cross was the incarnate word of God. Because he's the one that is able to heal and fix our problem and destroy death by being the incarnate word of God who was crucified for us. We don't sit there dividing him, body or human or divine. We don't do that. The incarnate word of God crucified for us. And he is also the one that risen from the grave. All right? And just to, so we don't get any confusion, did he die? Yes, he died. But his divinity did not depart. What, what is death? Someone's soul separating from his body. So his divinity did not separate from his flesh, neither did it separate from his soul. It remains. Yes, he died. But yes, he's risen. The incarnate word of God for us. And because of that, he's capable to heal humanity. And because we're going to be his bride, we get healed with him. If we accept everything, if we participate with him in everything, through repentance and baptism and Holy Communion, all these things, we're one with him. So may you do that. And eventually, check your life regularly. Live the life of repentance so that we are able to become his, truly his bride and receive an eternal life in his name. May the Lord be with you this week. Enjoy it. Stay strong and attend every one of them and enjoy it and be transformed so that the, the really transform, real transformation can happen in your being. God be with you and glory be to God forever and evermore. Amen.